Okay, in part three of my talk, I will present yet another construction of uniformly distributed sequences with a very small discrepancy. So we will um, switch to another context. And this context was given by Stefan Steinerberger, who recently proposed to study whether regular sequences could be constructed via dynamical systems. So his idea was that suppose we are given n points in the unit interval and then we construct the n plus first point in a greedy manner. So he, he suggested a particular function here and he suggested to construct the n plus first point as the minimum of the sum of certain energy functionals. So here you have an X and here the XK denotes um, the first points that you are given and he suggested to define the next point on the location of the minimum of this sum. So where this function gets minimal, this X should become the XN. If there is more than one minimum, if the minimum is not unique, then you can pick any minimum you want. And interestingly, Steinerberger proved that independently of the initial conditions, so independently of the initial set of endpoints you start with, any such sequence satisfies a discrepancy upper bound of n to the minus one half times log n. And in particular, he did some numerical experiments and these led him to conjecture that the discrepancy of any such sequence actually satisfies the bound n to the minus one log n. So he, he conjectures that these sequences are actually low discrepancy sequences. And even more, he conjectures that there is a constant that does not depend on the initial segment from which this construction is started. So what he is saying is start with any set of points and then let the algorithm do its job and asymptotically you arrive at the sequence with the same distribution independent of the initial um, perturbance. So he, he suggests that this procedure somehow self-regulates and asymptotically gives you something very regular. And the aim of this third part and in particular, the aim of my paper was to give affirmative answers to these conjectures in a very special setting. So I considered the setting when we are only given one initial point X zero. And to do this, um, I need to introduce uh, some concepts. So I have already mentioned in part one that van der Korput sequences are one of the most famous uniformly distributed sequences. And the way you define a van der Korput sequence is as follows. So you start with an integer n, you write it in base two representation. So you have these coefficients a0, a1, a2. So these coefficients are always numbers from the set 0, 1, and then you have powers of two. So you write the integer n in, in its base two representation. And then you flip it at the decimal point. So the so-called binary radical inverse function takes the binary representation of n and just divides every um, summoned here by a power of two, which is one larger than the index of um, the coefficient in the binary representation. So this is the radical inverse function and the van der Korput sequence is just defined as the values of the radical inverse function if you um, input increasing integers. So the first few elements of the van der Korput sequence are one half, one quarter, three quarters, then you start with one over eight, five over eight, three over eight, seven over eight, and so on. There is this ping pong of points, which comes from the base two representation of integers. Now, 
Um, there are several very interesting papers by Henri Ford, who is actually based in Marseille, who generalized the definition of van der Korput sequences in two ways in the early 80s. So, first, he replaced the binary representation of an integer by its general Beatic representation. And this naturally gives you a Beatic radical inverse function. So, instead of working in base 2, he was working in arbitrary integer bases. And in a similar way to the classical van der Korput sequence, he obtains a sequence for every integer base b. And furthermore, and more importantly for my work, he also um, extended the class of, um, of sequences by introducing permutations on the digits. So he defined the generalized or permuted van der Korput sequence as follows. Instead of taking the Beatic radical inverse function, he actually introduces a permutation of the n digits and applies it in this infinite sum. So, assume you are working in base 5, and then whenever in the integer representation, in the b adic or 5 adic integer representation of n, there would be, let's say, a 3, he would replace it with the value of the permutation of 3. So, for example, every 3 in the, every coefficient 3 would become a 2 every coefficient 2 would become a 1, and so on. So, in this way, he introduces permutations, and of course, this makes the class of sequences he can consider much, much larger. And he showed that every such sequence is uniformly distributed modulo 1, and even more, every such sequence is actually a low discrepancy sequence. And this immediately leads to the question, well, which permutations work well? So, are there permutations that give you better results than the identity permutations, which would, which would go back to the classical van der Korput sequence? So, Henri Four studied these questions in a series of papers and um, derived very interesting results over the years. In my context, um, I'm not so much interested which permutation gives me the van der Korput sequence with the smallest discrepancy, I am more interested in the general machinery that Henri Four um, developed because it turns out that I can describe the output of the greedy algorithm of Steinerberger in terms of permuted van der Korput sequences. And to do so, I will define a very specific subset of permutations and set them in relation to the greedy algorithm. And so this definition works inductively. So I define a set of permutation for every M, which is a subset of all permutation in base 2 to the power of M. So I only work with bases which are powers of 2. Now I can start just with m equals 1. So then b1 is just 2, and the set of permutations in base 2 I'm starting with is just the identity, 0, 1. Now I can always construct the set pm plus 1 from pm in um, the following way. First, I multiply every permutation sigma in pm just with 2, and this gives me just a set of tuples, of, of um, 2m tuples. And I denote um, every such tuple as 2 sigma and the set of all, the set of all such tuples as 2pm. In a next step, once I have multiplied all permutations with 2, I can add odd integers to it. So I can add odd integers between 1 and 2m plus 1. And they will give me a new tuple, which I denote as 2 sigma plus the odd integer. And I denote the set of all such tuples with 2pm plus um, the odd integer a. And so finally, the set pm plus 1 
is defined as the set of all permutations which are concatenations of tuples. So I have the first half of the permutation is a tuple two sigma. The second half of the permutation is a tuple two sigma prime plus an odd integer. So note that the first half of the permutation always contains even numbers, whereas the second half of the permutation always contains odd numbers. So there is no intersection between the two halves. And sigma and sigma prime were just permutations of PM. So in that way, I go from PM to PM plus one. And as an example, we can construct P2 and P3. So first we have that 2P1 is just the set 0, 2, and 2P1 plus all allowed odd integers would give me 1, 3, and 3, 1. So I can either add 1 here, which gives me 1, 3, or I can add 3, which gives me um, 3, 1. And so consequently, if we just um, concatenate every element of the orange set with every element of the blue set, we get the set P2, which consists of these two permutations. Now again, we can multiply all permutations by two. We can add odd integers, which in this case is one, three, five, and seven. And we get a set of eight permutations from which we can build now P through by combining every element from here with every element from here and so on. So this is just the way um, I construct um, my family of permutations. Now, the very interesting thing, at least for me in this context, is that with the help of, these, of this family of permutations, I can encode and get a hand on the output of the greedy algorithm. So, if I start from a very particular energy function f, so this energy function has to be symmetric, has to be twice differentiable in the unit interval, and the second derivative has to be positive. So you can think of this um, as a strictly convex function, for example. Um, then we can define a sequence as follows. So we start with x zero equals zero, and we define xn as the argument of the minimum, the minimum goes from x in uh, the interval one zero of these um, sums of evaluations of the energy function. So turns out if you define xn in that way, then you can show that for every n, for every fixed n, there always exists an m such that n is upper bounded by a power of two, and there in particular exists a sigma from my family PM such that xk is the case element of a permuted van der Korput sequence generated by this sigma, and the discrepancy of this sequence x is the same as the discrepancy for this particular n of the um, permuted van der Korput sequence, and using several symmetry arguments, it turns out that the discrepancy is actually the same as the discrepancy of the first elements of the classical van der Korput sequence. So in a way, this theorem tells you that the output of the greedy algorithm is just a very, um, a very involved permutation of the classical van der Korput sequence, and it's a very symmetric one. So you basically just move the points around in a way that does not change the discrepancy. So the whole theorem is really built on a long, long tower of symmetry relations that I use throughout the proof. The interesting thing is, that in a way it indicates that like these kind of dynamical algorithms can give you very interesting structures and somehow in this special case it turns out that the output 
is something we already know. So the output can be related to the van der Korput sequence, but this is only the, a very special case where we start in one point. As soon as we start with two or three or more points, we get sequences that we can actually not construct in different ways, or at least not in ways I'm aware of. So I think it's a highly particular and unique situation that these two things coincide. This is on the one hand good because it makes it possible to prove that the output of the algorithm is actually a low discrepancy sequence. And on the other hand, it also shows that there might be some interesting structures out there that we were not able to capture without the greedy algorithm. So as an interesting question, I would like to ask, well, which structures arise when we use different classes of functions that are not covered by the theorem. So if we if we change the assumptions on F, can we get similar structures? Can we get totally different dynamics here? The other thing somehow relates to what I just said. So on the one hand, this result is interesting in my opinion because it gives a novel definition of the van der Korput sequence. And on the other hand, it shows that um, potential theoretic approaches along the lines of what was proposed by Stefan might indeed have very intimate ties to discrepancies. So there seems to be some interesting phenomenon in the back. And um, finally, well, is there another family of functions that can be used to reconstruct permuted van der Korput sequences in other bases? So I was not able to uh, reconstruct any other van der Korput sequence apart from the classical one in base two. And of course, what can be said if we start from a set of two points or of more points? So I think there are many interesting questions to consider here which um, I would encourage anybody to look at. There are some more references to the work of Stefan and of Louis Brown. And um, with this, uh, I would like to thank you for the attention and I'm happy to receive questions. <laughs>